The adoption of the pendulum in the 17th century radically changed the European clock. The great advantage of the pendulum for controlling the escapement of the clock is that, unlike earlier controlling devices, the freely swinging pendulum has a definite period of its own, or vibration. The principle was discovered in Italy by Galileo in 1664 to 1642. But for the practical purposes of European clockmaking, the development of the pendulum began with the Dutch mathematician Christian Huygens. Huygens' first version of the pendulum was invented toward the end of the eight, 1656. A year later, Solomon Coster died, 1659, of The Hague, obtained exclusive patent rights for making Huygens' pendulum clocks in the Netherlands, just outside of Amsterdam and The Hague. The Fromentiles, a prominent family of London clockmakers, sent a family member, John, to become a journeyman in Coster's workshop in The Hague. And by November of 1658, the Fromentiles were able to advertise their pendulum, pendulum clocks in London. The museum's hooded wall clock of about 1660 to 1665 by Anharius Fromentiel, the father of John, is a fine example of an English clock with a traditional verge escapement, now regulated by the newly developed short pendulum derived from Huygens' invention. About 1670, Isaac II Touré, clockmaker to the French king Louis XIV, made a pendulum clock with a dial that indicated hours, minutes, and seconds. Now in the collection of the Museum of the Beaurave in Leiden, the clock was, according to tradition, the personal possession of Huygens, and it is the oldest preserved astronomical regulator that we know today. A domestic clock with a short pendulum probably made by Isaac or perhaps by his son Jacques Thierry III with a magnificent case and pedestal by Andre Charles Bull made about a quarter of a century later in the museum's collection. Although Huygens published his idea for a position pendulum in a small booklet titled Horologium in 1658, he did not produce the full theory of the pendulum for the scientific world until 1673. Publication Horologium Oscillarium Sib Demato Pendulorium. By that time, English and French clockmakers had already put the pendulum to use, permanently changing the technology of clocks. It remained for the English to complete this development. There were a number of practical problems, however, in making the pendulum a true, truly accurate timekeeper. It was to eventually to become. First, the pendulum had to be lengthened and the arc of its swing reduced. The new escapement had to be found to help shorten the arc, as well as to diminish the retarding effect of the older verge escapement had on the pendulum. The standard solution proved to be the new anchor escapement, regulated by the pendulum of slightly more than 39 and a half inches in length, giving it a beat of one second and allowing seconds to be recorded on the dial of a clock without the use of complicating or additional gearing. A weight at the bottom of the pendulum in the form of a double-sided convex disc or bob was found to offer the least resistance cutting through the air. The problem of making a case to stand on the floor to protect the long pendulum as well as the weights of a domestic clock was solved in the course of the 17th century. With the evolution of the long case or more popularly the grandfather clock. All these features are present in a long case clock of about 1765 through 78 by the father of time, Thomas Tompion. By the end of the 17th century, clocks were accurate enough to be used for serious astronomical observation. Tompion had, in fact, made two year-going clocks with 13-foot pendulums 
for the Royal Observatory in Greenwich, where he finished these in 1676. John Harrison's chronometer, familiarly known as H4, proved that it was possible to solve the age-old problem of finding the longitude at sea by the use of an accurate timekeeper. And then John Arnold and Thomas Earnshaw managed to make chronometers in sufficient quantities at moderate prices after Harrison, so that by the early of the 19th century, the chronometer had become a standard instrument of navigation. Technical advances and superb workmanship combined to place England at the forefront of clockmaking in the latter part of the 17th century and into the 18th century. So much so that by 1711, in order to protect the French trade, King Louis XIV banned the importation of English clocks into France. French clockmakers, on the other hand, took full advantage of the luxury trade that flourished in Paris due to the ban of the French or the English clocks, providing domestic clocks in splendid cases ranging from products of cabinet makers such as Bull in the early part of the period to the cooperative efforts of bronze founders, porcelain makers, and marble cutters which began to predominate before the middle of the 18th century. The cases were often, often closely related to the sculpture and smaller decorative objects of the period. Such clocks as a cartel or wall clock with a Chantilly porcelain case and a movement by Etienne Le Noir, or a mantel clock with a patinated bronze figure titled Times Employment, L'Emploi du Temps, and a movement from the workshop of Julien Leroy and his son Pierre Leroy are fine examples of these decorative domestic clocks. French clockmakers also contributed to the advancement of precision timekeeping. In the 18th century, indeed, Ferdinand Breton was making marine clocks or chronometers in Paris, while John Harrison was still trying to convince the English Admiralty that his chronometers could be put out to practical use. So he was just a few steps behind Harrison in the race for the longitude prize worldwide. Not in England, but in, in worldwide. By 1760, Breton had constructed his first marine chronometer. In 1773, he published his Treatise de Horlogerie Marine, and in 1766, he obtained a standing order for two marine clocks, a year for the French Navy. Pierre Leroy made experimental marine clocks and contributed greatly to the technical inventions that were necessary and the construction of a successful marine chronometer. French domestic clocks with long pendulums, such as the one with the movement by Ferdinand Breton, made use of the improved timekeeping properties of the steel and brass gridiron pendulum invented in England in the 1720s. The clock made about 1768 to 70, also incorporates a system of gearing using Breton's own variation on the kidney-shaped equation of time disk for indicating the annual irregularities of solar time, a device he published in 1763 in his essay Sur Lagerie, Augsburg, which had been one of the chief suppliers of clocks to all of Europe during the late Renaissance period continued to make domestic clocks, some with highly decorative cases, such as the one Reposé silver reliefs by John Andreas Theo, one of Austria's or Augsburg's most renowned goldsmith. Augsburg clockmakers never completely exploited the new techno tech or horological technology, however, they soon lost their prominence in the history of clockmaking. 